I give a dash to Dr. Prashad. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Um, that was very kind of you, uh, Dr. Yogesh. And uh, let me just share my screen. Bear with me. Um, Uh, so can I just check and see whether, A, you can all hear me and whether you can see the slide? Yes, sir, we can see you and we can uh, see your slide and we can hear you loud and clear, sir. Fabulous. So uh, it gives me a great pleasure to be invited. Uh, it's a huge honor. Uh, my dear friend and colleague, uh, Sachin Gandhi, and a uh, phenomenal team that he has uh, uh, working around this particular conference. Uh, so without further ado, it's time sticking on. Uh, I've been asked to speak about transoral laser surgery for benign lesions. And uh, uh, the assumption for this particular talk is that we have a, a, a cross-section of uh, 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 doctors who are involved in ear, nose and throat surgery, and possibly uh, non-doctors as well, uh, of various levels in their uh, experience and training. And so if some of this seems rather uh, dull and boring and obvious, please forgive me. But I think it's worthwhile just uh, knowing a little bit about lasers since the remit of this talk is about lasers. And I'll do my best to uh, be fair about the laser usage, although my particular weapon of choice is the carbon dioxide laser. So in, in essence, the history of lasers uh, goes back to Albert Einstein, uh, as, uh, as does a lot of, uh, a lot of physics uh, in the 20th century. And then thereafter, the concept of using stimulated absorption of radiation and then uh, compounding this, uh, this light energy into extremely powerful light energy uh, 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 resulted in the uh, um, uh, Nobel Prize for Towns in Sholo. And then thereafter, Theodore Maimann uh, uh, developed the first uh, solid-state uh, laser, which was the Ruby laser. And progress in lasers, therefore, and thereafter, uh, was fairly exponential. Uh, the first gas laser was actually uh, produced, uh, and then thereafter, the semiconductor laser. It was only in 1963 that the carbon dioxide laser was, uh, was developed. So uh, this is a rather good quote for those of you uh, uh, who are reading this. I think it, it's worthwhile remembering that mistakes are actually the, the first step to uh, to actually improving things. So Maiman's ruby laser was a progenitor, and then it was Kumar Patel, an Indian, uh, no less, uh, who uh, was the inventor of the carbon dioxide laser in his time in the Bell Laboratories in America. And in effect, all this is about the selective absorption of laser light by human tissue. So if you're going to use a laser, it's worthwhile understanding some of the physics and understanding that there are certain aspects of the physics that are true and pure, and uh, that they will not deviate. So therefore, you have chromophores, which are pigmented uh, 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 structures or uh, characteristics in the human body, and uh, they are based on the very fact that they are called chromophores on, on, on color. And so we have various pigments, and we also have things that are unpigmented, uh, water being one of the most important uh, features in the human body. But oxyhemoglobin is... Uh, is, is uh, Red and melanin can be in various shades and hues of the same. I like this picture very much because it gives you an idea of if you're going to use a laser, where exactly is this laser going to be uh, absorbed? And where in the spectrum are you really targeting your laser energy? So you can't really expect one laser to fit all sizes. Some lasers are fairly versatile, but not all lasers uh, cover all options. So depending on what you're really working at, uh, you need to uh, you need to choose your laser wisely. So I'm not suggesting that any of the lasers over here are, are poor. Sorry, bear with me. Hi, Sajid. Right, uh, sorry, uh, it's a phone call by Sajid. Can you hear me? Yeah, definitely we can. Okay. Now I just happened to get a call from Sajid Gandhi. Anyway, so let's move on. And so what we're looking at over here with the colorless laser, or the carbon dioxide laser, which I'll spend most of my time talking about, uh, is, uh, is, is tissue that is colorless and mainly water being, uh, being the uh, pr uh, predominant tissue in the human body. 70% of most tissue consists of water. And it is for that very reason that the carbon dioxide laser happens to be the workhorse for uh, for most um, uh, head and neck and ENT surgeons. 
So here again, you've got this uh, thing. You're not expected to memorize this or remember it, but it'll give you an idea of how the various absorption spectrums work on wavelength. Now, power density is also a particularly useful thing to understand if you're going to use lasers in benign laryngeal lesions. And I'll go down that route a bit later. And the, effectively, what you're talking about is when you look at the power reading of the laser, you've got to multiply it by 100 and then divide it by the surface area. And that gives you the density of basically how much power is actually being, uh, being exposed to a particular area. And of course, since a laser is based on light energy, it's effectively radiant. And the radiant uh, exposure is based on the power density with the time. So how long you, you use that particular laser and how long you apply it to the particular tissue. So this is also very important because as you go through the type of lasers, you will discover that certain lasers have advanced uh, massively. Certainly the carbon dioxide laser allows the surgeon to actually uh, perhaps not calibrate the laser and allows the machine to do it. And therefore, it allows us to minimize the amount of energy and destruction that we do to the tissue that is deeper or around the area that we, we wish to uh, extirpate or cut. So this little uh, uh, table over here, uh, just uh, for those of you who are interested, will tell you exactly uh, what the wavelengths are sort of power that you can generate from these lasers before the machine backs up. That's something to bear in mind. So you can see that the carbon dioxide laser is actually a rather powerful laser. It can, it can get up to about 100 watts. Not that you'd use 100 watts in the larynx, but nevertheless, it's worthwhile realizing that this is an extremely versatile laser that has the capacity to have a huge range. Now, laser surgery, uh, uh, for those of you who are historians or who enjoy that sort of thing, uh, basically, vis-a-vis uh, uh, -vis the larynx, started off in dogs and then are, uh, thereafter in human beings. And a lot of that work took place in Boston and the United States of America. And uh, the, uh, uh, the very uh, uh, first uh, progenitors and pioneers of this particular work uh, included a gentleman called uh, uh, Mr. Yako. And Mr. Uh, Yako, when he was a bit older, was still looking rather distinguished. And uh, uh, Professor Strong. So they were the they were the they were the gentlemen who were involved in trying to use this particular device that was de designed and invented by Kumar Patel, and adopting it for the use in the human body, namely in the dog's larynx. And uh, and thereafter things took off. So this is a particular book uh, which I would certainly recommend to trainees. And for those of you who haven't got this in your library. Uh, certainly in universities, etc., it's worth getting it. And this is a seminal work by Stein and Ambrosch on the multiple uses of, of uh, transoral laser. Uh, and I think that uh, this particular work is well worthwhile uh, picking up and reading if you happen to be in this game. Now, the laser uh, that I'm talking about, uh, not that I have any particular interest or commercial interest or any uh, uh, disclosures to make is the uh, is the laser that I'm familiar with, which is the Acupulse laser, which I've been using for many years. And for those of you who'd like to know a little bit more about it, well, there were actually two uh, gentlemen, I uh, think they were Israelis, uh, Sharman and Kaplan, and uh, that basically became a condensation of their names into Sharplan. The Sharplan laser, which is a carbon dioxide laser, uh, then merged with another company called Coherent, and then they formed Luminous. So there we are. So this is where we are. And there are different types of lasers. There are uh, the lasers, which is the, the duo laser over here, which allows us to uh, use an articulated arm to then uh, reflect the light by a system of uh, reflecting mirrors, no different from a periscope, to the area of interest, or also to use a hollow fiber, uh, which then reflects the light through the hollowness of the fiber, effectively a material that is akin to silver, and then that allows the uh, light to be bent and then steered in the direction that you wish to use it using a flexible endoscope. So there are there are two ways of dealing with it. It's line of sight, line of sight, straight shot, or via a flexible, for all intents and purposes, fiber. And therefore, the Acupulse duo uh, manages to blend both. What you have over here is purely a fiber system. You can see the fiber popping out over here. And uh, there we are. So the carbon dioxide laser is a very, uh, it ha has intrinsically a long wavelength. And one of the problems with this particular laser as a result is that a lot of the fibers that were designed for the much shorter wavelength uh, uh, laser uh, systems, the KTP, uh, the homium YAG, et cetera, uh, the carbon dioxide laser just didn't, did, could, not, uh, could not cope with that sort of uh, uh, optical fiber. 
often the fiber would just blow up or burn. And so therefore the progenitor the carbon dioxide laser was a line of sight uh, straight shot laser. Uh, that, that changed in the 90s with the development of the OmniGuide and the WaveGuide fiber. And that allowed us for, to be able to actually use this particular laser in, in much different and more versatile settings. The penetration of the carbon dioxide laser it, depending on the uh, type of, uh, of energy that you are using and the system that you're using, can actually go down to about 50 to 100 microns. And this is extremely different from the NDAG laser, which is uh, effectively a laser that depends on color, use it in tattoos and all that, uh, that sort of thing, skin blemishes, etc. cetera. And, uh, and that particular laser, like the KTP, goes into the uh, realms of, of millimeters. So this is vastly different from the depth of penetration compared to the carbon dioxide laser. And of course, uh, if you decide that you want to uh, reduce the amount of, uh, of uh, radiant energy that you are actually subjecting your tissue to, then you do not put it on continuous, but you pulse it, and therefore you allow a certain amount of thermal relaxation, which allows the tissue to actually regain some of its normality. And then, of course, between the pulses, you have an interpulse pause that allows for the tissue cooling and uh, the delivery system I've already described. And then thereafter, I shall go into a little bit more uh, into the AccuSpot micro manipulator, which many of you are familiar with, and thereafter with the AccuBlade and the scanning system. So here we are. So these are the carbon dioxide laser options. For those of you who are familiar with the laser fiber, I don't need to say very much more, but for those of you who are not, this is not a uh, contact uh, laser fiber. This is a non-contact laser fiber, and it's usually a fiber that needs to be perhaps about a centimeter or slightly less away from the tissue, and the beam spread is not very much. You can actually focus the beam, and it gives you a pretty good cut. The difference, however, is that uh, the carbon dioxide laser with a hollow fiber technology is not uh, uh, capable of using a scanning Modality, so therefore, this is effectively an accurate spot. What you have over here is the laser, and here you have the micro manipulator, and this is your toggle over here, or your joystick, and is a system of mirrors that actually allow uh, the laser light to uh, come through. Uh, carbon dioxide lasers, by definition, are colorless, and therefore, the there is another laser that actually is a, it's a helium neon laser that is part of the system that is red in color. And uh, so, therefore, prior to you using the laser, you need to actually make sure that your CO2 and the helium neon are working in tandem and that uh, where you fire and where you see the light actually match. Okay, so this, these are the laser basics. Um, forgive me for those of you who are extremely familiar with this, but my uh, impression, certainly uh, amongst many people who do use this laser, is that they're completely unaware of this. All right, the next thing you need to know about is uh, digital scanning technology. And uh, uh, this is also uh, slightly... Uh, uh, pedantic, but uh, for, for purists who are laser aficionados, and given the fact that this is after all to talk about lasers, it's worthwhile trying to understand what sort of laser you're using, how the energy is actually provided to the particular tissue, how the computer systems generate this uh, energy and release it. So what you have over here is you have a continuous wave. So when you're using, when you're using a, a laser in continuous wave, so let's just say that you're using an acupulse continuous wave, you're not getting a vast amount of energy. You're getting a continuous amount of energy all the time. And sadly, the tissue actually doesn't have very much time to cool off or relax. That causes a vast amount of charring. And that in itself is not a huge sin. And it's not uh, uh, a, a flaw in the technology. But if that is exactly the sort of thing that you're trying to achieve, you're trying to achieve low-level power with a huge amount of uh, continuous energy uh, to that tissue without any form of thermal relaxation, then perhaps you are uh, really gunning for continuous wave. So the, 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 the technology is not wrong. It's a question of what are you trying to achieve got super pulse over here so what happens is that every time you press that uh, pedal uh, you fire the laser you get this vast surge and then it falls back extremely quickly so you can imagine the amount of time that is actually is above a particular level is minuscule before it falls back to normal and then with ultra pulse you get a surge but it continues for a little while and then it drops so all these things may seem trivial uh, and you say, well, you know, I just use the laser. My boss always told me that you put it on continuous, press it on five watts or two watts, and off you go. Well, in essence, that's probably uh, someone who has bought himself an extremely uh, fancy car but doesn't really understand all the various modalities of it, 
probably better off just going for a stick shift rather than a fancy Ferrari. So the the uh, modern carbon dioxide uh, CO2 lasers with scanning technology and various types of uh, uh, energy uh, uh, delivery systems are uh, usually for, for uh, laryngologists and head and neck surgeons who want a particular or want the capacity to choose different types of energy delivery systems to therefore allow them to uh, meet the needs for that particular operation in that particular case. So it's, sir, it's not... It's not up, so uh, uh, we've, got the, we've got scanning technology here, and this is the laser scan I was telling you about. And if you look over here, all this is is that it's a basis of uh, rotational mirrors. And this is computer generated, and it allows you to get to certain shapes and sizes. So you may have watched some. I watched uh, Dr. Gandhi doing some uh, work uh, uh, earlier on. He was, uh, and uh, effectively, uh, this was a uh, this was a case. I think he was using a two or three millimeter AccuBlade. And so, how do you generate these patterns of light? Well, you generate these patterns of light based on a computer generated system. That allows a system of mirrors to move around to give you a particular shape and size. Now, the waveguide is a flexible fiber optic, and it's uh, as I said to you, it's uh, it's not it's not uh, a uh, device that allows you to to uh, scan, and uh, its focus is uh, compromised. And it's an expensive fiber; it's about eight hundred euros. In Europe, you can use it five times. In America, it's a single-use fiber. Can also be used for benign laryngeal lesions, as I'll show you afterwards. There are other systems, and I certainly don't have time to go through these. But it's worthwhile just being aware that, um, for instance, uh, the group in Hamburg and the groups in America are using KTP. The KTP is now almost obsolete; it's not being produced anymore, and they've moved on to a blue laser, which has a slightly lower uh, wavelength but a uh, similar sort of uh, similar sort of action. So there are different types of lasers, and uh, they, they are used in office, uh, they can also be used in the operating theatre, and they are fibre-based. So the, uh, the scanning systems allow, allow you to sweep, shape, a few microns deep. So when you, look at the, uh, when you look at your laser, what you will see is that it has a, a particular uh, section, on uh, certainly in the uh, uh, luminous laser, where it has a, a depth, and it puts one, two, three. Depth is not 100 or one millimeter, two millimeters, three millimeters. It's purely, it's purely uh, based on uh, a, a um, uh, laboratory-based analysis by the company on how much absorption you have. So uh, a depth of one is about 50 to 150 microns. Depth of two is maybe about slightly double. And depth of three is about 350 microns. So that is how, how shallow the amount of energy that is being absorbed. So here you are, the reflection in, in a, a hollow fiber. And you can see the hollow fiber being used by my mentor and dear friend and colleague, Mark Remarkle, uh, over here in, uh, in, in a patient who is awake. So there are various systems, micromanipulator, joystick, and then laser fiber, etc. Okay, so here you are. So this is a laser where you're using a fiber. I'll just very quickly play all these videos to you because time is moving on. This is actually for a patient with a, with a Zenka's diverticulum. So I'm terribly sorry that this is not a benign laryngeal lesion. But what you can see over here is a fiber, and the fiber is being administered through a scope. And you can see that this is another way of dealing with. Uh, and we, we tend to want this particular thing to be rather coagulative and slightly charring. It helps with the uh, uh, cicatrization. We want cicatrization. We want more tissue damage over here. We want the tissue to be coagulative. This is, this is not a laryngeal lesion. This is a Zenka's diverticulum, and this is the bar over here classic bar and you go through the mucosa and finish off with all the muscle fibers and uh, this is a pretty nice use of a laser with a fiber so there you are so this is uh, if you can't really use your straight shot kind of articulated arm you can always use a fiber it's a bit of tissue glue that's going in and there we are so this is a waveguide fiber again let's see what we have over here and here we have an epiglottic so this is also not larynx but i just wanted to show you that this is a patient who's clearly awake, and you can Are see you that. Running? Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, okay, I better move on. So, uh, yeah. well, we'll move on from the scanner to uh, a um, I'll play this for you. And so, for here, you have an intracortal cyst. This is the same thing with the scanning technology, and you can see that what we have over here is. Extremely clean cut. This is probably a depth of one. So this is probably about 50 microns. 
And it's really no evidence whatsoever of any bleeding. Uh, there's no charring whatsoever. So you can use a microflap technique. I'm not suggesting that you can't use a microflap technique. But for those of you who are very au fait with the use of lasers and extremely uh, uh, familiar and comfortable with using carbon dioxide lasers, then this is an extremely useful tool. You can see the cyst over here. And I'll just let you finish this video and show you very quickly a few more. Uh, and there we are. So that's, that's the cyst being removed and it's probably burst. Okay, so angio intactic polyp, there you are. You can just laser that off using a line. A papilloma, papillomatosis works very well with a laser. Remember, this is an epithelial condition. You do, you do not need to use more than a depth of one. Uh, all you want to do is just uh, vaporize the tissue that is extremely superficial without damaging the super, uh, superficial lamina propria. Uh, forget about the instruments. This is an interesting paper for those of you who are keen to read a little bit more about it. I'd certainly recommend Marcel Gay and I trained in London together. I think he's at Southampton. This is a useful uh, paper as well as this particular one with laser hollow fiber. This is an angiotactic polyp or a uh, rather a huge angiotactic polyp, and that comes off very nicely with a CO2 laser. You can work that out quite easily. Uh, There's a scanning, a bit of the histology with the different types of things, etc. So here we are. It's histology, equipment, is a fiber. Uh, KTP, YAG, as I mentioned to you before. Um, and We can include, so that would be nice. Yeah, so uh, I think in conclusion, you know, uh, we can use the uh, CO2 laser uh, for benign laryngeal lesions, umpteen uh, laryngeal lesions. Uh, and uh, as long as you're au fait with the technology, I see no reason why you can't use it. Epidermoid cysts, sulci, etc. And uh, uh, I'll be sorry, but you know, it's just very hard to be able to go through all these cases in 20 minutes. But nevertheless, I think uh, I have to really uh, stop over here given the constraints of time. Uh, thank you very much once again for the invitation. For those of you who are more interested in understanding and learning about the use of lasers in benign laryngeal lesions,